my name is Steve Milton, as Lisa just said, and uh, would like to welcome you all here. Would absolutely love to thank uh, CMJ, as well as uh, Microsoft for uh, making this all possible. Uh, also would like to begin by introducing everybody else up on stage here. Uh, we have Charlie Whitney, Dave Reif, and Camille Narwatil. I almost got it. Um, listen, this is um, uh, who we are. I uh, thought it would be uh, great to give you guys a little bit of a uh, background on the project. Um, I am the founding partner of Listen. We are a uh, creative and uh, strategic group uh, just down the street. Uh, and um, uh, most of our work uh, is focused, uh, and many of the projects we do are focused on the intersection of, of music and marketing. Um, the two projects that we're going to talk about today are uh, uh, part of an ongoing uh, partnership that we have uh, with Microsoft. Uh, Delka is, is the first project um, we're going to look at uh, that we worked on with, with Matthew Deere. And the second, uh, something that's actually launching this week, uh, uh, was a uh, live show uh, visual uh, system uh, for Neon Indian. When we think about music and, and technology, and we think about uh, you know, uh, how Technology has really, over history, shaped um, um, how musicians are able to express themselves and how audiences uh, receive uh, music and then how we also define what is music. Uh, technology definitely plays a role in that. Um, and uh, this is true now uh, more than ever and is core uh, to the work that we're doing uh, with Microsoft. Um, I think you know, specifically our work involves developing and uh, concepting ideas and projects uh, like this uh, so we can bring together musicians uh, with technologists and talented folks like the people who are here uh, on stage today. Delka uh, is a project here. We're going to watch a video uh, in, in just a minute, which will help set it up. And then Dave and Charlie are going to talk a bit about uh, get under the hood a little bit on this project. Uh, but it was a project, it was an installation that went up at the uh, New Ink space um, at the New Museum uh, over the summer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I'm going to let the, the video speak for itself. So uh, I think we should be able to play that. Technologies allowing for this, this openness. It's this living, breathing sound sculpture. You can play with it and tweak it. I wouldn't make the song that I made for Delka at any other point in my career or my life because it only works for a space like that. To have that opportunity and to meet wonderful new people and learn from them and see what they're doing and, and get ideas that I wouldn't have come up with, I mean, that's, that's the best. That's, that's art. We saw this project as an opportunity to create something that had never been done, pulling together an amazing artist with a team of amazing artists using Microsoft's technology. Seeing the guys break it apart, I'm seeing the guts of the system. It's a lot of math and a lot of numbers. Because these guys are smart, <laughs> and they're really smart. The big idea that we were exploring was uh, being able to step inside of Matthew's music. This piece is really about creating a sonic environment. So one of the ways that we're going to achieve that is by installing 40 loudspeakers throughout the space. Those will all be linked together into a spatial audio system that allows for a three-dimensional field of sound. You'll be inside of all these different musical ideas that make up one beautiful composition. 
We were able to leverage the Microsoft Kinect's ability to track people's movements spatially through this experience. The Kinect is everywhere in this thing. You're almost always covered by a Kinect. We specifically sourced this fabric material. It was opaque to the depth cameras, so we can actually read the surface of the fabric, but it was transparent to the color and infrared cameras, so we can actually see through it. As people push on the walls and displace the membranes, they're actually able to change the quality of the music. Different areas of the installation affect the music in different ways. Sometimes a user will be changing the actual part that's playing. Sometimes they'll be introducing new parts into the music. We wanted every interaction to feel very powerful for the audience. So if we take the drum part, for example, as they press in, the rhythmic density of it becomes much more complex, but we're also changing the timbral qualities of those synthesized drum sounds. So all of these parameters allow the audience to have a multi-dimensional influence across the composition. So you could visit this piece on a number of occasions and you'll hear something different each time. It would never be the same if you went there twice. Our desire was to create a new type of architecture influenced by how we experience sound. Doing interactive design, it's really about creating a magical experience and having really powerful things like a Kinect that help you create those experiences. There's so much that we can do with a project like this. The more accessible these technologies become, the more people are able to use them and do surprising things with them. People want to make music. People want to be part of the music making process. Technology allows that. Your mind is totally free to wander. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just however far you want to push it. To be able to, to bend music, make music, and put that in different worlds, that's what makes this fun. So uh, that should help to give a little bit of context uh, around the project, uh, what we're up to, and how that all came together. Um, and uh, now I think uh, hand it over to Dave uh, to talk a little bit about the composition and uh, the sound and light uh, and uh, even a bit more. So. All right, great. Check, check, check. We're here. Uh, so I'm glad that video played. I can kind of be done now. No, we're going to, we'll go a little bit under the hood. Uh, yeah, you can, you can go ahead. Um, I lead a company with Gabe Liberty, who is out there somewhere. Where are you, Gabe? Raise your hand so everybody knows that's Gabe Liberty in the middle. Um, we have a creative studio called Dave and Gabe. Uh, we do a lot of sound and light work with immersive and interactive environments. Um, I have a background in architectural acoustics and uh, like how sound behaves in space. Gabe has a really strong background in production, and you can see why we ended up doing uh, a lot of the work on this project. If you go to the next slide, you can see some of our work. Um, it all involves interaction. It all, it, most of it involves sound and lights. Um, go ahead, go to the next one. You guys already know. Oh, good, that was out. So um, I think one of the first things that we all talked about as a team, that entire team that you saw in the video, uh, was w what is this interaction going to feel like? Uh, like how are you going to trigger these different moments in the sound, and how are you going to create this composition based on on what Matt already wrote? And so we l really loved the idea of something being physical, right? So actually physically touching something, something like an interface, but something more architectural. And so we had these two different types of meshes. Um, one of them is kind of spandexy like this, and one of them is more like a net. And as you pushed into it you would change the composition, you would change different parts of, of this music. And so based on how you're pushing like this and also where you are in the space, like if you're pushing on this side or that side, you would trigger different sounds and different effects. Um, you saw in the video, this is kind of how it works. So that's great, we can go to the next one. But very tactile was, was what we were going with. Um, and then w at the same time, we were working with Matt on the composition. So. Matt totally got it right away. He met with the whole team. He totally understood, like, this would be rad as an environment. I'll create some music. But 
how does it work in terms of making that music interactive? Because typically you're listening just over headphones or out of your speakers and you're just taking it in as the listener. But what we were all going after was putting you inside of his music, so pulling his music apart and surrounding you with it, but also giving you as a listener agency to change what's going on, to, to manipulate the sounds that are happening. No, not yet, not yet. So what you see here is uh, the Ableton session. So, so Matt created his composition in Ableton, and then we all shared that session together. And we worked with him to take specific tracks. So you're seeing six different tracks here, so six different parts of the music. But we write multiple clips per track, right? So there's different energies within each one of those tracks. There's different kind of sounds that are happening within that, but it's all aligned to one type of sound. So like one might be a hi-hat, one might be a kick drum, one might be arpeggios. That's all kind of in the vertical there. And then within each one of those are different sounds so that when you push into the netting, you can trigger those different sounds. So if you go to the next one, we should see that. Uh, this is kind of the way that we made up the MIDI notes um, that were synthesizing some of the drum sounds. So you see, as we push in, you get more rhythmically complex, uh, a little bit more dense patterns. And then as you push out, all of that goes back away. Next slide. And so I don't know, uh, go ahead and hit it again so it plays the movie. So you can kind of see right in the middle, um, there's a clip selector. And then this is the microtonic VST. Right in the middle, you'll see right around here, somebody is starting to push into the music. And you see that little arrow clipping down uh, on the different tunes. And you hear the, the different complexity that's happening within the music. I think it's a little out of sync with the visuals, but you can also see within the microtonic, um, there's different filters happening, um, and that's all based on the real-time uh, information about where people are pushing as well. So this is a custom tool that we wrote within Max for Live that Yotam Man that you saw in the video wrote um, in order to, to be able to make this music more interactive and not just like a static copy of what's going on. Uh, and then, so, so now we have the interaction that we want to do. We have the music, and the music is, is uh, flexible. Um, so now we wanted to reproduce it over a huge audio system that's all around the listener. And so we had 44 loudspeakers. And the point of this was not for loudness. It's not to, to make the thing really loud. It's so that we can pull the tracks apart. We can take the stems out and give each its own place to be. And we can also give all the stems, like, or some of the stems, we give them trajectories. So there's, there's sounds that are moving around the space all around you. And then there's some sounds that are moving based on what you're doing within the, within the architecture. Uh, so we laid it out in six different zones, A, B, C, D. So A, B, and C, and D were, were kind of four different instruments. And then E and F were when you climbed up into the middle of the netting, you'd get this kind of drone type thing happening around your ears if you were there. And if you weren't there, it wouldn't be there. Go ahead. And then this is kind of what, what it looked like in one zone. So we had 10 loudspeakers for each of those quadrants. And some of the sounds would be really diffuse and be happening all around you if you weren't pushing into the net. And then if you pushed into the net, it would, it would go local to where you were. So you could really like spatialize where the sound was happening just based on what you're doing on top of all the compositional stuff that was happening. And you already saw that. I think this is just a really funny clip because Gabe is in slow-mo with a speaker on his head. I, I had to show that, sorry. Keep going. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and then in terms of the spatialization, we used Max MSP. Um, we had some of the tracks within the piece. Uh, these were not so much interactive, but they were always moving around you. So what you're looking at here on the right side of the screen is like a top-down view of all the loudspeakers in the space. So you're looking at the floor. Um, and then those green dots are actually sound sources. So that's like particular parts of his track that are always like slowly rotating in the space. And then we had these hi-hats, which is kind of that crazy one randomly going all around. And that ended up feeling like it was like a fly kind of going all around your ear. It was super cool. Uh, and this is kind of what it looked like to mix the piece. It's really interesting to mix a piece over a large spatial system like this and also interactive. So we had to set up in front of each one of the quadrants and get the local mix right and then sit and listen to the overall piece and get the overall thing right. So there's like a ton of variables, but that's kind of what it looked like. Um, and then you'll notice here, go ahead, that uh, there's lighting in the space too that was also reactive to what you were doing in the space and it was also tied to the music. So Ableton was kind of driving some of the lighting as well. Um, so what you're seeing here is again, a plan view overhead of the lighting system, a whole bunch of DMX addressable, uh, wash lighting that we hit the netting with. Um, go ahead. 
and then we used Touch Designer to drive that. So um, we had these different color palettes within Touch for each part of the song. There were kind of three parts of the song as it in the timeline. Um, and then go ahead, as you pushed in, you'll see here, so this is the, the live installation, um, and you'll see different color palettes happening. Um, that's based on people actually pushing and pulling. This is the software work in real time. And then you'll see, uh, this is kind of what it looked like to be there. And this is the arpeggio, as you can hear. The lights go in and out. The lights also change color based on how far in you are. And this particular instrument was an arpeggiator. So as you, as you push in, you get higher frequencies. This is a binaural recording. If you were all listening over headphones right now, you'd hear as Gabe was pushing with his right hand and soon with his left, you'd hear it spatialized to that side and the other side. Yeah. And then this is what it looked like uh, in the end. I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, but again, around the perimeter, you were pushing and pulling that kind of spandex mesh. And in the middle, you were encouraged to climb up in the top and kind of chill out there and listen to the entire piece. I should also say the, the, the point of this was so that everybody could manipulate these different tracks around the room, but all contribute to the one composition together. So it wasn't like you were isolated. If you were listening on one side, you would hear the entire piece happening. Um, and I was just going to end on this to say that the, we used eight connects, um, and Charlie here, who's brilliant, wrote a really rad application that he's going to tell you about. But it was all done over OSC over the network. So the connects and Cinder were driving uh, Ableton, Max for Live, and Max MSP, and then the, that was also driving um, Touch Designer for the lights. Charlie, take it away. I am Charlie Whitney, and sometimes I go by Sharkbox. And I was responsible for doing a lot of the programming that was taking the connect and taking this data and then shipping it out to the other pieces so that we can make cool music. Uh, I'm going to show you some prototype-y kind of things, because obviously we couldn't build this thing full scale. Uh, this was a really big installation process. Uh, it was fabricated from scratch by uh, our friends, the principals. And so this is us in their shop, their very messy shop uh, at the time. Uh, and this is just a piece of this fabric. So we tested uh, a bunch of different fabrics, and we needed something that felt really good. Uh, so my background is in kind of doing installation work. So I am a coder, but I do a lot of kind of media art installation. And if you want people to touch something, it's got to feel really good. So we had a couple other pieces of fabric that were maybe more readable by the Kinect. Um, but they didn't feel as good. And if you're in somewhere where it's uh, this completely immersive thing, like with all these 40 channels of sound, it's non-directional, kind of. So you don't know where it's coming from. So you really feel like you're inside something. And so we wanted to encourage people to touch and explore this thing that you're inside of uh, to make it really comfortable. So this is a single swatch of this fabric that we had. We ended up stitching three of these together for kind of the outer panels. And these deform really easily. They're really soft so that we can get these sort of highlighted areas where you're pushing out. And like I said in the video, uh, th the holes in this are of a weird size where the, uh, the Kinect 2 is a uh, time of flight camera as opposed to the Kinect 1, which is more like laser grid. And for whatever reason, the size of the fabric is just the holes are big enough so that the depth camera hits them and stops. But all the other cameras see right through them. And we had a really funny experience when we were testing this, where if you've pushed too far, if you're really stretching it out, you're actually stretching the holes out. And there becomes a point where if you push it too far, the uh, holes actually became see-through. And then all of a sudden, the depth camera would pop through, and you would see a person behind there. It was really weird. Uh, so we almost like had to work around that, but it's a cool interaction that maybe something in the future. Uh, here's another uh, pretty dirty prototype. This is one of the first things we did. So that same piece of fabric we were just looking at, and there was even a, a video that Dave showed earlier, just pushing on this one piece of fabric. And what you can see here is there's these four blue dots. And this was our first attempt at getting uh, differences in the fabric, like what happens when you press up, down, left, and right. So what we're literally doing is just sampling the depth at the fabric underneath these blue points. Uh, so on this, the, the, uh, the top point is fully triggered. And so we were just seeing, we had a four channel sound system hooked up just to mess around with this. And we were just seeing, can you do up, down, left, right? Like, what is actually possible? Uh, I don't know it had, if anybody had done like as fine articulation of fabric. And it was a lot of testing to figure out what this thing could be. We weren't even sure at the beginning. 
cool. <laughs> Uh, so this is actually, this is Dave from above. This is something that we were going to try to do. We had this idea for these kind of uh, cylindrical things that you would go inside of or be on the outside of. And we wanted to see if you could test the fabric deforming from up above. Uh, this is going to be these really weird percussive, like almost drums we were going to make. Uh, but it didn't really work, so <laughs> this disappeared. But it was a cool point of the process. Uh, and this is, uh, actually, could you go back to the blank one? I think that was a video. Can we, no? All right, never mind. Maybe it's later. All right, keep going. All right, so this is where the connects were actually positioned. So this is just the front side of it. There were four on the front, and then there were four on the back side. So this is just looking from the front. And you can see that we have uh, two in the far corners, which were looking at that really fine, that soft, touchable mesh that I was talking about. And then these two in the kind of in the middle, we're just looking at the, uh, the cargo net fabric kind of in the middle. So if you go to the next one, this is kind of what they were covering. So the blue ones are the ones that were covering the fabric net, and then the pink is covering the cargo. Uh, so I, this is very approximate. I just drew this, but it gives you an idea of how much coverage we really could get. The, uh, the Connect 2 can see, uh, I think, 120 degrees, maybe even a little bit more. So we were able to get like close and really wide with these and get a really good amount of coverage. And then we were able to get like an XY position of where somebody was touching on this fabric. We could kind of approximate a, uh, like, so we, we can get the X, we can kind of approximate a Y. And then we were trying to get a, a Z position, how far someone pushes into the fabric. And it was a little bit tricky because we're not hitting it head on. But what we found was that if you just push a little bit, it only deforms the fabric a tiny bit. But when you start pushing huge, the whole fabric moves. So it was a much better metric to kind of see like how much fabric was moving instead of how far they were pushing it, because a bigger push would move more fabric. It's kind of weird, but <laughs> I'll show you an example. So this is a video that's maybe playing. All right, so this is actually an application uh, that you can download. Uh, it is, we put, we kind of took some of our tools and made it into an app that you can download. So you can see this pink box that's happening. This is sort of the amount of fabric that's being displaced. And then there's a dot in the center, and this is sort of our XY position. So up in the upper right-hand corner, we have the image from the depth camera. The, uh, the left side is a, like a, just like the debug, what's happening after all these sliders and filters are messed around with. And uh, that thing down here is uh, like what it's called our region of interest. So that's what we're really looking at and trying to figure out like where is this depth. It just is a little like snapshot. Um, so this will actually output OSC. So if you're a musician and you want to do something with uh, soft tracking, uh, you can just boot this up and it'll start sending you messages that you can map to Ableton or Max or whatever. And this is... Uh, it's, a little bit blue, but this is the address. It is github.com slash C-W-H-I-T-N-E-Y slash Delka Tools. And it's free. It's open source. Uh, it's pretty rad that Microsoft let us put that up. Let's check it out. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. There you go. I think we're going to open it up to questions, uh, but first we're going to go uh, take a look at this uh, Neon Indian project. Um, uh, I think just worth saying about this one, um, we're going to watch a little preview uh, video uh, that'll give you a sense of, of, of what, uh, what is about to premiere uh, with the Neon Indian show uh, this week, uh, actually tomorrow at Webster Hall. Um, but uh, really, again, like with Matthew Deere, Alan uh, from Neon Indian, we sat with him and, uh, you know, we had some conversations about how can he, you know, take, uh, how can they, the band take their show to the next level. Um, started kicking around some ideas and uh, really arrived at, at what I think is a really great output. Um, I think, let's play this video and then we can hop into it, Camille. <laughs> Short and sweet, but you get the picture. Um, so, Camille. Yes. 
Hello. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kamil Navratil. I'm the creative director at Volvox Labs. Uh, we're based in Brooklyn. Uh, we specialize sort of in interactive installations and content creation, as well as uh, kind of pushing all these ideas into physical world. Um, yes, I guess it's missing a slide. Yes. Uh, so what was interesting with this project is, um, so essentially before we work with uh, other DJs and musicians, uh, we thought about how to sort of recreate the virtual into the physical world and add something on stage. Uh, so, you know, digitally fabricate walls that we projection map or uh, use scrims that we project through to sort of add this uh, another dimension on stage. <clears throat> but this one, we actually took it backwards and sort of used the Kinect sensors to recreate uh, the, the actual reality, the human geometry, and, and put it into our digital software. So we called it uh, Reconstructing the Realities. Um, and essentially, uh, the project consists of three elements. So uh, first, we're going to use the Kinects uh, to sort of scan the environment where the band is. So we're going to look at the stage, what's around, and kind of use the Kinect to, to get the data, the geometry data, to sort of put it in our software and use it to generate visuals. Uh, this will be then, uh, obviously, we're also going to look at the band members to sort of uh, look at their movements and get data from that uh, and project it back behind them as an extension of the reality that they are in. Uh, and also, we'll be able to use artist content to sort of feed uh, the color schemes and different effects uh, within the virtual system. Uh, so again, uh, quickly about the process. Uh, Scanning, I'll, I'll show in a bit, I have a little demo, but the Kinect has a really cool feature where you can actually point it at something and retrieve uh, geometrical data as, a, as an object and sort of use it anywhere in other 3D packages to sort of texture it or spin around it, uh, shade it, so it's really interesting. Uh, the second part is looking at the musicians through the Kinect sensor, so we have five Kinects on the stage. Uh, each one generates particles and different instances within uh, our software, which is Touch Designer, uh, to sort of drive the, drive the visuals and kind of represent the music in real time. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, we can get inputs uh, from the musicians, so MIDI or RSC data. Doesn't matter, we can get it in and sort of also drive colors and shapes and scale of all these objects. Uh, so that also ties into the style of the band or the DJ that possibly can use this package later on. And then at the end, we combine, uh, combine it all together and sort of recreate the uh, reality. So as Steve mentioned, we sort of sat down with Neon Indian, with Alan, uh, and he, he gave us his references, his sort of visual aesthetic uh, for, to inspire us a little bit and sort of add our style on top of it. So what we came up with is three different uh, styles within the show. Uh, he's a big fan of glitchy things, so there's a lot of glitchiness. Maybe you saw it on Fallon last night. There was a nice little glitchy river flowing. Uh, but we're also sort of pushing the new technology in. Uh, so you can see these particle people walking around. Well, it's going to be the band members, uh, as well as virtual cameras spinning around the stage. Um, so it should be a pretty cool mix of, of, of different styles. Um, so yeah, so scan. So I'll show you quick demo of, the, of what the Kinect can do. Uh, <clears throat> so, let me just grab this. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, just to let you know, Kinect, uh, the awesome thing about it is that Microsoft opened up uh, the SDK for it, so you can access pretty much any information that the Kinect provides. So uh, whether it's the tracking of your face, tracking of your movement, uh, sound uh, tracking, and as well as scanning of the 3D environment, the environment where this Kinect sits. Uh, so what I'm using here is the Fusion Explorer. So you can see the environment, there's the depth camera, uh, the camera pose finder, but what it really does... Yeah. 
<laughs> You're the model, Dave. Um, so this is how we'll scan the stage. Uh, obviously, it's Dave, but we can look at room and stage and instruments. And we'll essentially add that in front of all the dynamic simulation particle people. Uh, but what the cool thing about this is, too, you can actually walk around an object and, and get a 360 scan that you can use later on. You can actually texture it, too. There's a capture color mode. Um, we're using the depth image to sort of get information from space and generate uh, different reactions within our software to where the musicians are, where their hands are, and where, where we are in space, essentially. So Connect is really great for that. It can actually tell you a lot about the environment that you're in. And here you can see the, the effects based on uh, the depth image and the point cloud images. Point cloud image is essentially a position of every pixel that the camera looks at in XYZ. So here you can see all these instances attached to those points. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting how you can actually see the, uh, the 3D geometry of the shapes that the camera is looking at. Um, and quickly about the setup on stage. <clears throat> so we have five connects. Uh, Alan, the uh, main guy, <laughs> uh, we're looking at his whole silhouette to sort of, he's very dynamic on stage, uh, so we're going to try to capture his en entire movement and reproject that as uh, dynamical simulations. Uh, all the other guys uh, will sort of focus on their movements, uh, on the instruments and whatever they're doing to create the sound, uh, which is a little bit different than what we uh, used to do before with musicians and bands, uh, mainly DJs, uh, because since we're looking at their movements while they're creating the music, this is already giving us a sort of sound reactive visual, uh, which is different when working with DJs. You're trying to really syncopate everything to the beat, and you know the DJ just stands there, really. So we're trying to ma make up for that with visuals. But this one is we're actually getting a freebie by looking through these sensors at the musicians and getting these sound reactive visuals. Uh, so here you can see uh, all, the <clears throat> all the connects are looking now at a person in space. This is within uh, Touch Designer software. Uh, and so we, we're able to actually look at the points in 3D vert, uh, environment and sort of position them wherever we are so that during the performance we can actually move the virtual cameras from one guy to another and kind of see, let's say Drew at this point was actually making uh, the most movements. We would like to probably cut to that to, to sort of show the, the situation and the action. Uh, all that is happening on GPU. Uh, GPUs are getting super powerful these days, and anything that's real time needs to be sort of sent through that. Uh, so we develop a bunch of techniques to, sort of, to look at the depth camera image and generate particles based on that. So we have like hundreds of thousands of objects uh, and geometries uh, happening at the same time from five people uh, and running at 60 frames per second. So that's really amazing. Um, <clears throat> so when Steve approached us, he also mentioned that this will be touring and this should be packaged so that anyone can actually tap into it, like I mentioned before, where you can add your content in and drive, uh, drive the visual style uh, of your own show. So we created this sort of DJ interface where you can access everything from. Uh, <clears throat> change the virtual camera positioning, uh, change the colors, choose your tracks, and actually also play with the Kinect cameras. You see on top there, there's five. Uh, you can uh, manipulate the depth image and what the camera can see in terms of distance. Uh, and on the bottom, you can see all the virtual camera switchers. So let's say, you know, Whoever is interested at this point, you can switch to that in, in super quickly. As well, you can set it to automatic mode. So it's going to just switch around on its own. So great job, Camille. <laughs> Thank Round you. Round of applause.